I have a story from my time as a state police officer in northwestern Montana. There were a few odd situations over the years, but nothing compares to this. I was sent out to a rural homestead to investigate a complaint of property damage and potential theft. The homestead was an off-grid cabin, about as deep in the mountains as you could get, while still having access to a halfway decent road in the winter to make it to town. The couple that lived there were odd, to say the least. They were mostly self-sustainable out there. They raised a few farm animals and grew a lot of their own food and stored it over the winter in a root cellar. It was nearing the end of fall and most of the mountain roads were closed for the winter. The drive up to the cabin was a little hairy, but I made it okay. When I arrived, the only thing I knew was that something had happened involving the root cellar, but I waited for them to tell me their story. And it was quite a story at that. It began last summer. They noticed food going missing from their garden. They figured it was the local wildlife and installed a fence around the garden. But food continued to disappear. The garden was done for the season, but I checked the fence. It was eight feet tall and there were no signs of animals getting through or under the fence. The only way into the garden was through a gate and the couple both said they never once found the gate unlatched. They installed a mesh cover on top of the fence to prevent any birds or animals that could climb the fence. There was truly nowhere that an animal could get through this fence. Now, wildlife eating through people's gardens is definitely a problem out here, but it wasn't something you'd call the police for. After harvesting the garden and moving everything into the root cellar, someone, or something, began breaking in and stealing food from there. And here's where it gets weird. There were no signs of any animals. No prints, no scat. The door to the root cellar was not damaged in any way, but there was a significant amount of things missing. They told me that pretty much everything in there was stored in various sizes of mason jars. The entire jars were missing. Nothing was knocked on the ground, just vanished. If the food thief was an animal of some sort, We'd expect to see jars on the ground and things damaged or broken in the cellar. But there was none of that. The man just looked at me. I could tell he wanted to speak, but something stopped him. I told him to go ahead, that I've probably heard stranger theories. He told me he had been watching the root cellar through the window every night for the past two weeks, and he finally saw the culprit. He said it was a human but it wasn't a normal human. He didn't know whether to call the police or fish and wildlife. I asked him to elaborate, and he said he saw the thief heading to the cellar just after dark, and it was definitely a person. The lack of outside lights made it difficult to see, but he went outside to confront the suspected food thief and scare him off. He met him coming out of the cellar carrying a leather bag full of mason jars. He said the man was human, but he wasn't human like we are. He had a large brow ridge and deep set eyes. His face and body were square shaped and he was only maybe five feet tall. He was wearing boots and clothes that appeared to be made out of fur and animal hide. The man said it was like looking at some prehistoric history book. He yelled at the thief and it took off running towards the forest but before it did, it reached into its bag and tried to hand the man something. He didn't take it, but the person or creature or whatever dropped it on the ground and ran. He followed the thief to the edge of the forest, but it was too dark to try and track wherever it was. He went back to inspect the root cellar and see what all had been taken. It was at that moment that he looked on the ground for what the creature tried to offer him. There were arrowheads, spear points, and a couple of other stone tools. I had absolutely no idea what to do about this case. I took the arrowheads for evidence, but I didn't have anything else to go on. We couldn't find a trail in the forest to even attempt to track the creature. I was straight with the couple. I told them there wasn't much I could do here. 
They asked if anyone else in the area had been seeing these people. The man was convinced that there are, I don't know how to say it without sounding crazy, but cave people living out in the mountains, completely isolated from the rest of society. He said he wasn't sure if they were a separate species of human or not, but that they could be the cause for all the Bigfoot stories in the area. I can't say if I believed him or not. I never saw the creature. I did, however, follow up with the couple in the spring of the year. They were both out working in the garden when I arrived and had expanded it quite a bit. And strangely, they said they weren't having any problems anymore. On my way back to my vehicle, I glanced at the root cellar. The door had a display of arrowheads along the top that wasn't there last fall. I didn't ask any more questions. Looking back, I wished I had, but at the same time, I don't think I was ready to know exactly what lives out there in the mountains. I want to start off by saying that paranormal experiences never happened to me. I had a pretty standard childhood and I'm currently in my mid-40s. This experience, which happened when I was 25, was my first. For context, I had just graduated college but was having a hard time finding a job in the area I went to school. Eventually the lease on my apartment ran out and my parents offered to let me stay with them until I found some work. My parents had moved to a town near my hometown a few years into my college career. They, like many parents, wanted something smaller. One story, because my dad has bad knees, and just quieter in general. The town they moved to was slightly bigger than my hometown, but had more in it, so they were close to stores, hospitals, post offices, and all that. Overall, I liked the house. It was cute, small, but fit the way their lives were going. They offered me the second bedroom, which was just being used for storage, and I moved in with a temporary setup. Their bedroom was on the other side of the house, with the kitchen and a full bathroom between, so we had some privacy. For the first week, I just hung out with my parents, enjoyed a few home-cooked meals, and took it easy. Eventually, I needed to get to work trying to find a job. I had a laptop, but to give my parents some space, I'd usually head down to the local library and hang out in their community room. I spent a lot of time there the first few weeks just getting my resume up and running, joining job sites, searching, etc. I secured a handful of interviews and was able to spend a little more time at home relaxing before I went to work full time. The first experience I had was in the middle of the day. I'm a little ashamed to say I was actually taking a nap at the time. My parents were out shopping and I took advantage of the quiet house and passed out. I'm not sure how long it was after dozing off, but I woke up just feeling like someone was in the room with me. At first, I was thinking my mom had come to wake me up. I opened my eyes a little, the way you do when you're half asleep so not really open, and saw a figure in the corner of my room near the door. It looked almost beige, which made me try to blink awake a little more. I propped myself up and got a good look at what seemed to be a ghost. That's the only thing I could think at the time. It was a vague form of a young guy who was just staring off into the room right past me. He was varying shades of a hazy beige color and just kind of standing there, shifting from foot to foot a little. Obviously, I snapped awake, but didn't say anything or move. The hairs on the back of my neck were standing up, but it didn't feel like this was an evil spirit or anything. I held my breath, and after maybe 30 seconds, the ghost just dissipated, like fog. I thought about asking my parents about this, but decided not to, knowing I'd sound silly and they'd just think I was messing with them. For the next few days, I didn't see the ghost again until one night I woke up and he was in the same corner. I turned on the light on the nightstand, but he still didn't seem to notice me. This time, he stuck around longer, maybe five or ten minutes before dissipating again. For about three weeks, I saw the ghost on and off, only ever in the spare bedroom and the same spot. He never spoke, moved, 
or indicated he was aware I was in the room too. About two months later, right before I moved out into an apartment nearby, I casually asked my parents who would own the house before them. Another couple their age, they told me, with a few kids. I pried a little bit to see if they knew of any accidents, but didn't ask outright about deaths. They definitely picked up on the odd question, and I let it drop. I never found out why the ghost appeared in that room, and my parents have never brought up seeing him. Part of me thinks, because he disappeared from my last few weeks there, and I never saw him again, that it was just a random event. Maybe a spirit trapped in a loop that finally got free. At this point, I'll probably never know since it's been so long. I feel weird about bringing it up with my parents. They still live there, so maybe they'll catch sight of him one day, if he ever comes back. But the experience made me realize that there's a lot more going on around us than we're aware of. Few people are blessed with the ability to be entirely self-sufficient. Society seems to have forced us to rely on capitalism for survival. Many have lost our instinct to survive on our own. I have the pleasure of still holding on to a piece of my remote nature. Living on a ranch in Texas is perhaps the closest you'll get to off-grid country living. There's nothing like being able to grow your own food, raise your own animals, and make money while doing it. Every day has a routine, and it's not always easy, but it is always worth it. Part of being in such a remote area is the eerie feelings and sounds we sometimes hear at night. At a certain point, it stops being a surprise. It's just part of the territory. There's also the reality that a lot of people are, plainly put, ignorant and will believe anything. Honestly, I live in a part of town where 90% of the people fit into this category. So growing up, I always heard crazy stories about things people have seen and heard in the area. I can't say whether I believe it or not because there's so many different stories that come to mind. I couldn't possibly say I can 100% believe or deny any of them. Our family ranch is pretty big, meaning we can't take care of everything by ourselves. We have a number of farmhands who also live here with us in their own guest homes. They're more than just employees to us, but members of the family. A group of migrants themselves, we have essentially combined to be a blended family. The sky out here is different compared to what it looks like in an area with more light pollution. When there's a full moon, it's so bright outside you'd think it's nearly dusk. The stars in a clear sky illuminated everything and seemed so close to Earth. I remember as a kid thinking my father could throw me up in the sky so I could catch them. Every once in a while, me and two of the farmhands I was close with would stargaze from the fields. There was nothing better than looking at the constellations and pointing out the differences from the previous night. I have so many pictures in my phone of the stars I could make an album. But two years ago, when I really needed my phone to be readily available to take a picture of the sky, I didn't have it. What I saw made me question everything I thought I knew about human existence and the universe as a whole. Almost everyone, big or small, has heard something about extraterrestrial beings. Whether it's books, movies, or the news, aliens are always being talked about. Whether you believe in an E.T. resembling creature riding a bicycle across the moon or not is up to you. But we cannot be so adamant on denying that other life forms may exist in this universe. If you understand anything about galaxies and the immense size of space, you should know the probability of other life existing beyond humans is high. In fact, I would argue that it's a definite fact. Our inability to concretely prove it is not because it doesn't exist. Some things are simply just not meant for public knowledge. Imagine the frenzy the world would be in if there was concrete sufficient evidence backed by science and government officials proving their existence. I believe this fear of panic is what has ultimately prevented real evidence and accounts from going mainstream. Now, while this has always been my thought process, I never relay these concerns out loud. 
My feeling was that if I told someone this, it could create a placebo effect of some kind. I would rather wait to hear or see about it myself. Turns out, it's pretty common to witness weird things in the sky around here. The closest I had ever gotten was a shooting star, which wasn't exciting. How was it that I spent all those nights looking in the sky and hadn't seen anything yet? I found myself making it a goal of mine to find whatever it was everyone seemed to be talking about. Me and the farmhand saved up enough money for a telescope. This was our first necessary step to figuring out the unknown in our eyes. We headed into town buying the telescope along with just regular binoculars and a compass to see which direction we were looking at and take notes of it. Our hypothesis was if we could just figure out which direction the object was coming from, we could try and deduce where it came from using NASA footage or whatever. Obviously, this would not work. We weren't astronomers by a long shot. Still, it gave us something interesting to do and look forward to. Of course, that night, we couldn't wait to open the box up and try out our new toy. It was absolutely breathtaking being able to see so far away up close. It felt so surreal being able to see such detail, as if it was a made-up movie screen. We didn't see anything that night. Not discouraged, though, knowing we'd resume every day until we did. Taking our notes and directions every day, taking notice of which directions had more movement and attracted our eye more. It took about three months before we finally saw it. A beam of light flashing across the sky, obviously faster than a plane could ever go. It was larger than the stars, but smaller than the moon, zipping through the night. We couldn't speak or take our eyes off of it. Had I been able to avert my attention from the sky, I would have been able to get my phone out in time for a picture. It seems like that's often the case with these type of sightings. Witnesses are too focused on believing their eyes rather than getting proof for later. If you're wondering whether finally seeing it eased my mind or not, it didn't. I spent another 45 months trying to see it again. It must have been a once-in-a-lifetime thing because I have yet to come across another one. Still, I'll always keep my eyes to the sky, and so should you. You never know what you might see.